behavioral talk. Um, so I'm probably going to try to get through this today and see if I can start on GI. That will give us a little bit of time for review next Thursday before the test, right? That'd be useful for anyone. Mm -hmm. yeah. That yeah. you probably would find useful, right? Okay. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So uh, moving on to our antipsychotics. This is a, a big group of medications. Um, it's good to have a good understanding of this. Uh, some of your professors might be on these or may <laughs> need to be on these. Uh, so we'll see. Um, so anyway, so so where schizophrenia comes from, it, it's probably uh, multifactorial. We know there's uh, maybe some changes that go on, especially in utero. So there's you know maybe some potential for you know maternal exposure to substances that may um, be affecting the fetuses. Some people think it could be related to things like glutamate cascades uh, due to hypoxia at birth and all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. Certainly, there's a genetic component to it. Um, so like if both your parents have schizophrenia, you're more likely to have it as well. So. Uh, the pathophysiology, um, a couple different kind of thoughts behind this, and so the big thing is going to be with dopamine. It's going to be the big neurotransmitter um, that's seen uh, to have an effect with schizophrenia, and so that's where a lot of our, especially our first generation medications are going to be working, or working to block the effects of dopamine within the, the body, right, and within the CNS specifically. So some people feel like there is areas of hyperactivity and then areas of hypoactivity, and you guys have covered schizophrenia to some degree already, right? Do you know about the different types of symptoms there are? Yeah. yeah, so we'll talk about those a little bit, but there's positive symptoms and negative symptoms, and a lot of that's thought to be due to either dopamine hyper or hypoactivity, right? So you have too little activity in places like the, um, you know, the, the frontal cortex, and you might not have, and you have these negative symptoms, or you have too much activity in other areas, so it leads to some of the positive symptoms, and we'll talk about what those are uh, very briefly here. But anyway, so there's obviously some dysregulation with dopamine, and so that's what a lot of our first-generation medications are looking to fix, right? Um, there's also some other um, issues you may think there could be some over-excitatory uh, actions through glutamate. You know, glutamate's being one of our major uh, excitatory neurotransmitters, kind of the, the opposite of GABA. So there could be some issues there. And then also um, there's some activity with serotonin. So we'll see that when we get to our second-generation agents, there's also going to be some serotonin activity. And so that's going to be one of the key differences between your first and second second generation agents is that they add on the serotonergic uh, activity as we'll see uh, when we get to those. And so you have this kind of fun slide, this is how I learned uh, schizophrenia. Um, this is complicated but we kind of looked at this a little bit when we were talking about opioids but essentially what we're seeing here is that Laser pointer here. Um, again, you know, there's lots of different projections for these dopaminergic neurons within the CNS, right? So some of them are going down to the nucleus accumbens, some of them are going to be going down to the frontal cortex. And so what you can see here is that different um, aspects will have kind of inhibitory and excitatory uh, effects on this, right? So the idea here is, for instance, uh, if you have too much dopamine activity happening up here in this neuron, so too much firing off of dopamine, uh, more is being released here at the, at the synapse, and that's going to lead to some of these positive symptoms, right? So dopamine hyperactivity here. On the other hand, what you end up seeing uh, is that by having too much dopamine activity firing off from here, this is actually uh, activating an inhibitory neurotransmitter or inhibitory nerve, uh, which can lead to uh, negative effects here. So basically, it's just a, a disbalance. Um, just realize that different symptoms are coming about from these different um, dopaminergic neurons in different parts of the brain. And so um, when we talk about the ways that the first generation agents are really working to um, inhibit some of these effects, they also can worsen some of them as well. And so a lot of this is due to this um, different aspects of, of where the dopamine is working at in the brain. So we'll talk more about those in detail as we go forward. Don't get too hung up on the slide, just know it's complicated. Okay, so um, kind of how the, uh, they're going to be presenting to you is, is that the patient's kind of lost touch with reality. The, the brain starts to create these kind of faults, um, these kind of falsities for them. So they can have hallucinations, so especially if they're hearing kind of external voices, those auditory hallucinations. Um, they end up having these delusions or fixed false beliefs, you know, uh, delusions of grandeur. I often can suffer from those. Um, and, and they oftentimes will feel like their, their ideas are being influenced by outside forces, right, that usually are not going to be there. So, you know, they're, they're being told to do something. Um, they're not really... Uh, doing that themselves. You also see that they'll have some degree of these negative symptoms, as we'll call them. So their, their affect can appear to be kind of flat, inappropriate, uh, or could be labeled in a lot of cases. Usually patient hygiene ends up suffering as, as a, a consequence of this. And so, um, you know, it's not infrequent for a patient, especially with an acute psychotic break or something like that, to be presenting to the ED and kind of presenting just like this, right? Usually presenting with you know, these uh, you know, exacerbated hallucinations, they're not really taking care of themselves, uh, and this is where we can get into kind of acute management of this uh, and kind of help hopefully tune them up for more chronic management. 
So um, a lot of times they're going to have difficulty understanding the importance of treatment as well because they think that they're okay. Like They don't understand that there's a problem necessarily in some cases, especially with more mild disease. Um, so this means that medication compliance is going to be really, really poor. Right. So especially if, you know, the voices in your head are telling you not to take the medication because you're just fine. That can be a problem with compliance. Um, and that leads to more relapses and more hospitalizations. Right. So um, this is where we run into sometimes we'll use long acting medications. We'll use things that have uh, IM shots that are given in kind of an oily type mixture that allows for kind of a, a depot effect that will allow for months of, of therapy uh, with just one shot instead of necessarily having to take a pill every single day. So that can be one way we can deal with that compliance. Um, they're also gonna have kind of impaired ability to learn from their mistakes. So they kind of repeat the same problems over and over again. And there's a lot of substance abuse along with this, which can exacerbate those symptoms. So whether it be uh, ethanol, uh, nicotine is another common one, and then you get in all kinds of illicit substances as well. They may be abusing uh, as a result of this uh, as their condition. So the, the symptoms here, and these are important because uh, how you select your medications can be kind of dictated by what type of symptoms they're really experiencing. And so you can kind of uh, break it up into three sections. So there's the positive symptoms, the negative, and then the cognitive symptoms. The positive ones, um, they can be described as things that are there that should not be. Okay, so these are things that maybe the patient is, is producing out of, out of thin air, so to speak. So this is where they have kind of uh, paranoia. They think people are out to get them. They have um, hallucinations. They have a lot of this conceptual disorganization. <laughs> these are things that are, are there that really should not be, and the patient is kind of making them up. The, the negative symptoms, on the other hand, are things that should be there but are not. So uh, they have that kind of flat affect. They don't really have a lot of kind of outward-facing emotions. Um, they have this alosia, anhedonia. They can't really kind of act on their own um on their own thoughts or on their own wishes uh they may not be really speaking a whole lot it's a volition associated with that so um and again we'll see where that a lot of our first generation agents they work really really well for the positive symptoms they can actually end up worsening the negative symptoms right because like we mentioned in some areas of the brain you're gonna have hyperactivity of dopamine which is where you see a lot of those positive symptoms and that's where our first generation agents are really good for knocking those down on the other hand though the negative symptoms that's due to dopamine hypoactivity and so you'll see how the first generation agents can worsen that based on the their pharmacology which we'll talk about in a second and then uh, you have your cognitive symptoms. This is kind of impaired attention, memory, uh, executive function. So uh, again, this is going to be kind of present throughout, um, you know, along with the positive and, and negative symptoms. So our goals, um, really pharmacologic therapy is key. There's not, obviously, you know, there's some non-pharmacologic components of this, things like counseling and, and, and whatnot. Um, but therapy really should be pretty assertive during the first, you know, kind of five years. This is when the patient is most likely to have uh, the most psychosocial deterioration. So if you can kind of get them tuned up early, hopefully you can kind of stave off that and, and try to kind of help slow that progression. Uh, and again, when, when the schizophrenia usually manifests for most people. Yeah, right, 18, 20-ish, you know, usually like when they're going off to college or something, that's where a lot of that can kind of start to surface. Um, so think about that. Think about the time frame. And if you get that started early, hopefully you can keep those patients kind of um, functioning well before the disease really gets out, out of hand. Um, the treatment plans really have to be individualized based on what their presenting symptoms are. And this is really important when you're looking at the different pharmacology uh, of the medications we can use. And, and the time course for response is you want to at least try three months, right? So the drugs work faster than you would see would say um, something like an antidepressant. Like, you know, we said an SSRI takes usually how long to work? Like four to six weeks, right? So really before you start to notice any benefit. Now, for instance, if I had someone who's coming in with like an acute psychotic break, I can give them a dose of Haldol right now, knock them out, fine. That, that works very uh, quickly. But for more kind of chronic therapy, you really need to try it for three months or so just to see how they're going to respond to it, to see how the side effects are going to, to treat them, um, to see if they need to either you know, change your dose, switch therapy, something like that. So it's not that the drugs aren't effective early on. It's just that it takes time for you to really kind of, for the patient to kind of equilibrate and reach that new homeostasis to see um, how it's going to work for them. So uh, there's a lot of side effects associated with these medications, especially your first generation ones. Um, so we'd like to minimize the doses of medications as possible. So sometimes you need to kind of start a little bit higher to kind of get them under control. And then you can try titrating down based on what their symptoms are like. Um, hopefully we can decrease our rehospitalization. We know that's going to help benefit uh, society by decreasing hospital costs and hopefully improve their quality of life. And we'd like to achieve the best possible compliance. Sometimes that means we have to make the, the compliance kind of non-optional for them and give them something like an IM, uh, long-acting medication. Um, and then hopefully we can decrease the number of, of recurrent episodes and decrease cost. So the first generation antipsychotics, um, these are also... Sometimes we'll be called your typical antipsychotics. So there's typicals and atypicals. 
that just stands for the first generation, second generation, so you might see that, that the nomenclature used. Um, mechanism of action, the main thing they're going to do is blocking D2 receptors. These are dopamine type 2 uh, receptors. They're blocking those. Okay, So that means they're uh, competitive antagonists, and they are really going to be effective at decreasing the positive symptoms of schizophrenia. That means um, the main places they're going to be working at for, for doing this is in that nucleus accumbens where he said there's already going to be kind of too much uh, dopamine activity happening there. Okay. So uh, dealing with that, um, the other thing is, is because of the kind of frontal cortex being kind of dopamine hypoactive, this is going to worsen those negative symptoms. Okay, so this is where you can see that you know they may not be hallucinating so much, but they will have a whole lot more kind of kind of inward turn, kind of uh, the avolition, the elogia, all, all that kind of stuff. There that, that can be worsened by using these first generation agents because they're specifically targeting dopamine two receptors. Seeing so, as you might imagine, go back to this slide. So by blocking the dopamine receptors here, even though this neuron is kind of overfiring a lot of dopamine, those receptors are being blocked up, and so it can't really have as much activity. So this deals a lot with the positive symptoms here. Um, but down here, you're going to see by blocking that dopamine activity, it's going to worsen the, the negative symptoms. Okay. So again, that's all going to be mediated through the frontal cortex. So lots of adverse effects associated with these first-generation agents. Uh, has anyone ever seen the movie A Beautiful Mind? Russell Crowe. So uh, that one had a lot to do with, with schizophrenia and, and, and Thorazine, which is uh, uh, one of the main kind of first generation agents you'll see being used. But that one is actually very interesting to, to watch that to kind of see his progression of his disease and see how the medication actually affects him. So I'd, I'd recommend watching that if you have a chance because um, you guys have lots of free time anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> But um, one of the things you see when you block these dopamine 2 receptors is you have a, a, a reciprocal increase in prolactin, which can mean you can have uh, gynecomastia for, for the guys, you can have menstrual irregularities, you have galactorrhea for, for women, so uh, this can be problematic for a lot of patients. Again, all these side effects can lead to decreased compliance and, and early discontinuation of therapy, so think about that. Um, and the other thing is, is when you have dopamine antagonism, you also will have, have a reciprocal increase in acetylcholine. Have you guys covered Parkinson's yet? Okay, so essentially what we're doing here is is by giving dopamine blockers, you're kind of mimicking the effects of Parkinsonism, right? Because we know that Parkinson's disease is basically a decrease in the amount of dopamine being fired off by the brain. And so what we're going to see is when you give these medications, especially ones that are targeting specifically the D2 receptors, you're going to have a lot of Parkinson-like side effects. Okay, so one of the things you see here is that you have this increase in acetylcholine, floating around in the CNS, which is going to lead to more um, kind of these kind of uh, musculoskeletal effects, these kind of extra pyramidal effects that are going to start to pop up here, right? So this is a, a, a term that is unique to the antipsychotics, these uh, extra pyramidal side effects, or EPS, okay? This is one of the major limiting factors uh, from using a lot of these first-generation antipsychotics, okay? And this is something that's almost uh, non-existent with the second generation, which is why they are going to be uh, highly preferred for a lot of cases. So uh, when we're blocking a lot of dopamine within the, the caudate putamen, this is leading to lots of, of kind of motor dysfunction. Um, and you see these Parkinson-like effects. So you see this catatonia, you see more uh, motor rigidity, you see tremor uh, that can develop, they kind of get that shuffling gait, um, all those things that you can see uh, with a patient who has, you know, kind of the early stages to more moderate Parkinson's, right? Uh, so you can certainly see that. Uh, and then you can also see acutely dystonia as it can occur. And so um, these are involuntary muscle contractions. So it can happen within the face, the neck, the tongue. They just really can't control themselves. Uh, so you may see them like sticking out their tongue. Uh, you may see them kind of you know jerking over. They just really can't relax when they're in that kind of dystonic state. So um, a really good example of this was um, at the poison center. You, you deal with dystonic reactions on, on a somewhat regular basis. But we had uh, one case where our mom, who unfortunately was not going to win mom of the year that year, um, she was tired of the baby screaming, and so she went ahead and locked herself in her room and just kind of let the kid out to, to manage for itself. I think it's probably eight or nine months old. Um, kid ended up getting into her antipsychotics. Uh, it was a medication. The brain is Navain. Um, you'll see it on the list when we, when we move forward. But essentially, um, this kid getting an adult dose of these medications, blocking all of that dopamine, ended up having severe dystonia. And so if you guys heard of the term apistotonus, Essentially, it's this horrible back arching. Basically, the whole back, all the back muscles were, were uh, dystonic. And so the baby was you know, screaming, was in this horrible, horrible pain. Um, and so we ended up having to, to give medications to counteract that, which we'll talk about what those are in, in a little bit later. Um, but that's a really good example. Uh, another one 
the uh, I did not experience this my, myself, but this is one of my my boss's uh, old stores. But they had uh, patients. Uh, basically, it was a whole family. It was a, a mother, father, and, and child. Uh, it was probably like a teenager or something coming in, and, and they were all having these dystonias. They're all kind of like you know, um, tongue sticking out and all of that. And so they're trying to figure out what had happened. And the family said, well, we were just trying to do, we were, we bought some Valium off the street and then this happened. And so they're like, you bought Valium, that's diazepam, it's a benzodiazepine. You should not see dystonias with that. If anything, you should have, you know, decreased muscle spasms. And so they're trying to figure out what was going on and they, they had some of the pills left over. And so they went ahead and, and did an identification on it. And it turns out that that brand of Valium looks very, very remarkably like the uh, brand of Haldol or haloperidol, which is a first generation antipsychotic. And so what they thought was Valium ended up being this antipsychotic. And so they all ended up giving themselves this dystonic reactions. So um, very often you can see this as an, more of an acute side effect, especially if you have accidental ingestions of these. So just be aware of that. We'll talk about how to treat those a little bit later. So um, other things you can see uh, with the dopamine uh, antagonism is this term akathisia. We kind of mentioned this already. Is that severe kind of restlessness, the agitation. Uh, patients kind of feel uncomfortable in their own skin. They just kind of want to start moving and doing stuff. Um, so you may see a lot of pacing, a lot of shuffling feet. Um, and, and again, you can run into some issues where patients have this more energy. They can start to act on maybe some of these thoughts they've had. So if there's a concomitant depression, there may be some problems there. If there's any kind of th uh, thoughts of self-harm, things like that. And then uh, this is a, a long-term complication, but this uh, term called tardive dyskinesia, right? So, you know, uh, extrapyramidal side effects, dystonias, those are things that are going to happen kind of early on in treatment, and that's related specifically to the dopamine blockade. This tardive dyskinesia, on the other hand, is a problem where by chronically blocking the dopamine receptors, you end up leading to this dopamine receptor upregulation, right? So just like even with any kind of antagonist, you have upregulation of the receptors because they want to kind of get back to their, their normal. And so what you end up having is this kind of dopamine hypersensitivity, and unfortunately, this is not really reversible when this, once this kind of happens, right? So this is something that once it once it happens, you're always going to be kind of hypersensitive to dopamine. And so you get a lot of like kind of repetitive motions, a lot of chewing, licking movements, even though they're not really having anything to chew on. They'll just kind of, you know, that, that kind of motions, um, tongue protrusions, limb movements. Um, and so... Again, not always reversible, uh, and it's definitely not treated like uh, the dystonias. We'll see why that's different, because um, again, uh, it, it all having to do with this imbalance between the, the dopamine and the acetylcholine that's happening up there in, in the CNS, and that, that'll make a lot more sense when you when we cover Parkinson's as well. But essentially, um, you know, you'd have these patients who were kind of on these first generation antipsychotics for long, long periods of time. Um, so it was either, you know, develop the start of dyskinesia or they have worsening schizophrenia, you know, so it's kind of a lose lose situation for the patient. And, and fortunately, a lot of this goes away with our newer second generation agents. Uh, some other things you can see, especially um, when we're talking about things that either have high potency or low potency against that dopamine 2 receptor, um, a lot of other uh, of these drugs will have alpha 1 antagonism which can lead to a lot of dizziness, the postural hypotension, especially with your older patients who maybe don't have a lot of physiologic reserve, you know, so they go to standing and their blood pressure will, will drop pretty significantly. Um, and you also have that anti-muscarinic effects as well. So you guys remember the mnemonic for anti-muscarinic effects? What is it? Mad as a hatter, blind as a bat, dry as a bone, hot as a hair, the heart runs alone. Yeah. Right, so remember all of those. So a lot of those side effects are definitely going to be possible. So you can see the dry mouth, you can see the urinary retention, um, you may see some tachycardia, some sedation from this. So all of those things can can be uh, seen with the anticholinergic effects. Um, what you're going to see is that for the patients who have more likely to have the dystonias, um, you're going to see that this these anticholinergic effects can be good for that, right? Um, so I'll kind of go over that when we talk about the different potencies for. Uh, for these drugs because it's kind of a spectrum as we'll see. Um, but these muscarinic effects can also be really bad for tardive dyskinesia later on. So when we look at the chart, I'll kind of show you the, the examples of those and what that looks like. So um, you can also have some histamine one receptor antagonism. So this can also lead to some sedation. You'll see some weight gain with this as well. Um, this is gonna be especially pronounced with some of our second generation agents. Weight gain can be a very, very problematic and another big cause for um, early discontinuation of therapy. So remember that. And then you'll see that some of them will also have some cardiac effects as well, which make these pretty dangerous and overdose. Uh, you can see some QT interval prolongation. Tachycardia is obviously going to come about from things like the anti-muscarinic effects, um, but you can also have sodium channel blockade, which can affect your QRS interval and can, and can increase your risk for ventricular dysrhythmias. Um, so not super safe medications to overdose on, um, not something like your SSRIs, which are pretty safe, uh, even you know, if you take a tenfold overdose, but these can, can have some pretty significant effects. 
And then one of the, the most kind of catastrophic things you worry about uh, is going to be neuroleptic malignant syndrome. I'm sure you guys have heard about this one before, right? Right, so basically this is going to be seen more with the really high potency D2 blocker, so uh, namely flufenazine and haloperidol are probably going to be the two biggest offenders for this one. Um, but it can occur with any agent blocking dopamine, okay? Um, so basically what you're seeing with this one is you have uh, kind of four cardinal signs for this. So you're going to have the hyperthermia, you're going to have ultramental status, usually hypertension associated with it, and there's lead pipe rigidity. And so uh, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this before, but it's really, really interesting to see someone who's just like, you're just like, relax your arm, relax your arm, man. And he's just, I can't, I can't do anything with this arm. Like it's just, it's stuck, right? And so by having this kind of protracted uh, contraction of the muscles, what eventually happens? Okay. Rhabdomyolysis, right? So they, they get hot, they, uh, they can start to break down the muscle tissue, um, causing rhabdomyolysis. You start to precipitate out that myoglobin in the kidneys, you have renal failure, right? So those are the big things we worry about. Does anyone know how you treat neuroleptic malignant syndrome? Stop the drug. Yes, you should stop the drug. Is there any way you can reverse or deal with some of those rhabdo effects? It's a drug called dantrolene. So dantrolene, we'll talk about that later, but it's a, it's a peripheral muscle relaxant. And so you can also use it for malignant hyperthermia that you can see with certain um, general anesthetics. Uh, suctional choline can cause this. Um, they can also use it if they're having really kind of really bad lead pipe rigidity. So um, when we talked about serotonin syndrome, this looks very similar to neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Um, but like I mentioned with the serotonin syndrome is that usually they don't really have that lead pipe rigidity. They might have some increased clonus, but um, here like they're, they're, absolutely rigid, right? So that's kind of one key differences there. Okay, so here's our list of first generation antipsychotics. Um, the ones that I have highlighted are the ones I will probably use on the test. So these are good ones to remember, right? Um, so the key thing to remember here is that they're all going to have kind of different effects on, on the on the receptors. So you're going to have some that are very high potency for blocking the D2 receptors. Mm -hmm. And those are going to be more likely to see things like dystonias. So we're more likely to see neuroleptic malignant syndrome, right? So the more blockade they have the D2 receptors, the more they're going to see that, that effect. On the other hand, you can have some other drugs that are going to be more potent at blocking the muscarinic receptors. And so again, like I said, when you block dopamine, you increase levels of acetylcholine. And so if you have a drug that already has some anti-muscarinic effects there, then that's going to help to blunt some of that, okay? So for the ones that are less potent at the D2 receptor, you're also going to end up having uh, less dystonia because of those anti-muscarinic effects, okay? So a good example for comparison, if you're looking at something like haloperidol, notice how it works at the, get the pin out. So, so we have something like haloperidol here. This is a, a very good kind of go-to, like if someone's having an acute psychotic break, you can just give them a little IM shot of this. Knocks them out really nicely. Um, but so by giving haloperidol, this has a high D2 receptor activity, right? So it's high affinity for blocking that receptor. So you're more likely to see a lot of that, the prolactin effects. You're more likely to see more of the dystonias. So again, when I give that person who's having the acute psychotic break an IM shot of haloperidol, they're more likely to have a dystonia because of that. On the other hand, if you're comparison to something like uh, Thorazine, which is chlorpromazine, it has much less affinity for that D2 receptor. It's also going to be a little bit more, have more activity at the muscarinic receptor. So you're less likely to see dystonias. Certainly still possible, but because you're already blocking those acetylcholine effects, um, you're going to be helping to mitigate that. that Makes sense? So again, kind of base it on your patient. So if they're having a lot of issues, if you were to say give them haloperidol and they're having lots of issues with dystonias and, and muscle reactions and things like that, try switching them over to something that is less potent for the D2 receptor and something that has more anti-muscarinic effects, right? Okay. So it'd be kind of your, your go-to for, for how to, to manage those patients. Any others on this list? So you'll notice that some of our um, some of our nausea vomiting medications also will come from this class of medications. So these are called the phenothiazines. Uh, it's kind of their chemical class. So something like, let's see on this list, but if you see, actually, no, um, uh, prochlorperazine, this is a good one. So this is frequently used for either migraines or like nausea vomiting associated with migraines. So uh, infrequently will you see this used as a um, antipsychotic, but more often used for kind of acute nausea vomiting associated with migraines. Okay. So you can also um, kind of compare here, um, looking between your, your typicals and your atypical antipsychotics. So um, again, this is just more for kind of your reference. I'm not going to ask you on a test, you know, oh, mesoridazine has what moderate, high, or low activity against muscular. I'm not going to ask that, right? Um, but this is just for your kind of reference. You can kind of look to see uh, the differences here. Note that, you know, medications are going to have, say, more kind of high anticholinergic effects. 
um, you're up, you generally are going to see more um, uh, weight gain associated with it, right? Um, in general, you probably see more weight gain associated with the atypical antipsychotics, and we'll talk about those in just a little bit, but you can see them down here uh, on this list. We'll talk about more of those in, in detail. Okay, so first generation, like we mentioned, they're very effective for positive symptoms. If they're having hallucinations, uh, if they are having delusions of grandeur, uh, this is very good for helping to rid them of those. Um, but the side effects will often lead to discontinuation. Okay, so now, as I mentioned, you select your agent based on the symptomatology. So, um, you know, if they're having a lot of side effects associated with a high potency agent, switch over to a more low potency agent, right? So it's going to have more anti-muscarinic effects. Um, if you needed to treat the side effects, here's how you do it. So for the EPS, the extrapyramidal side effects, um, the dystonic reactions and the akathisia, this can be handled with anticholinergics. Okay, so that makes sense because if we're blocking dopamine, you're having increases in levels of acetylcholine, so we'll give an anticholinergic to block that, right? That also makes sense why you can use something with a higher anti-muscarinic activity like a chlorpromazine that can help with uh, to, to mitigate some of those. But if you had a patient came in, so say we had that little nine-month-old who came in with, uh, who had, had used that Navane and, and was having the, the Epicetonus, um, you can use uh, first-generation antihistamine. Something like diphenhydramine is very good for that. Um, there's also two other agents called uh, trihexphenidyl and benzotropine as well that we can use. Okay, Some patients may be put on these prophylactically just to uh, prevent the, the problems from ever occurring, or if you know they're more likely to have side effects, you might put them on these kind of scheduled. Um, but very frequently, we're just using these to help reverse these acute effects. So, um, and you don't want to just give them one dose and say, you know, send them on their way. Typically, you kind of give them at least 24, 48 hours worth to make sure that a dystonia doesn't come back. Because these medications typically have a little bit longer uh, duration of action, usually at least 24 hours worth. So, you want to at least cover them for that time period. Um, you can also use benzodiazepines. We'll talk about those in the anxiety section, but you can use those uh, for, you know, dealing with the kind of the muscle spasms associated with that. Those are going to be useful for that as well. For the tardive dyskinesia, um, because a lot of this is going to be due to dopamine kind of hyper um, hypersensitivity, you want to avoid anticholinergics because, again, by blocking acetylcholine, that's also going to lead you to have increased levels of dopamine, which can worsen those effects. So you wouldn't want to give them Benadryl for having these tardive dyskinesia effects. Uh, the biggest thing to do is to either discontinue treatment, uh, which is often not going to be possible for a lot of those patients. Um, some patients would end up going on these kind of drug holidays. You basically take a break from the med and then come back later on. So you kind of decrease the total body burden or body exposure to the drug. Um, but the ideal thing you do is just switch them over to a second generation agent, right? Because we're going to find that they mitigate a lot of those side effects when you go to second generation. Okay. If you did have NMS or neuroleptic malignant syndrome, again, discontinue the offending agent. That would be ideal. Um, the big thing you have to worry about is cooling the patient off because they can get very, very hyperthermic. Uh, so you can use like ice packs. You can use, um, you know, cooled saline. You can infuse into them. All kinds of different things you can use. Um, hydrate them well, and then that dantrolene or dantrine is going to be the the go-to drug because that can help to uh, relax the muscles peripherally uh, and will help to decrease all of that hyperthermia and that rhabdo that's developing there. And there's also a drug you can give, which is a uh, dopamine receptor agonist. The thought being here is to, you know, if you have too much dopamine receptor blockade, kind of reversing that by giving an agonist. And so sometimes you'll see bromocryptine being used uh, to do that, but not frequently. Usually the uh, dantrolene and kind of supportive care is kind of all they need. Bless you. So this is uh, just a good table just to kind of show you kind of where the risk periods are for some of these uh, different side effects and how you can can treat them. Um, just be aware uh, of kind of what we kind of covered in the previous slide. This is just a nice kind of um, kind of summary slide to, to kind of help you guys out. So again, looking at things like the you know the acute dystonias, the Parkinsonism, the akathisia, a lot of that's all related to dopamine blockade, right? So we know the ways that we can fix that. Um, most of the time, you can you know use things like an anti-cholinergic um, to help kind of reverse some of those effects. But very frequently, you need to switch over to an atypical antipsychotic. That's really going to be the best way to mitigate a lot of these kind of um, high dopamine blockade type of effects. So any questions on that? All right, so then we have our second generation agents. Um, these will be your atypical antipsychotics. And so the big thing here is that they're gonna have fewer extrapyramidal and, uh, and prolactin effects. So that's gonna be beneficial for your patients. Um, and they're also gonna have more efficacy for both those negative and the cognitive symptoms, right? So it may not be as potent at dealing with the positive symptoms as something like a haloperidol would be, but you can certainly have more effect for the negative and cognitive side. 
You also are going to see less tardive dyskinesia with prolonged use, which is also going to be very beneficial for your patients. Uh, and basically, should, these should be used as first line and less contraindicated, right? Or else they have really refractory symptoms, and you may need to try using uh, a first generation agent. And so, for a long time, even though we had some second gen agents that we would use for kind of chronic management, if they were coming in with a kind of an acute um, psychotic break, you could utilize first generation drugs, uh, especially in the IM fashion, to help kind of calm them down. Because again, how easy is it to, you know, someone who's kind of fighting you to give them an oral med? Not easy. Give them an IV, not super easy. So IM is usually the way to go for a lot of those guys. Um, so we give them something like IM Haldol, but you still have those side effects. Nowadays, we have a lot more options as far as second generation um, IM options. So we'll see things that we can give uh, to kind of help those acute agitation uh, episodes. So the way that they get around a lot of those side effects you saw at the first generation drugs is that they have less affinity for the D2 receptors especially in the striatal tract. So um, they may have a little bit of activity of blocking D3 and D4 receptors, but essentially they're going to have less EPS effects because they're less potent at blocking those D2 receptors. Okay, it's a big thing. The other big thing you're going to see here is that by blocking the 5-HT2 receptors, that helps to stop serotonin inhibition and in that mesocortical dopamine. So basically you're helping to increase the amount of, of dopamine, especially in the, the frontal cortex, increase the activity there, and that helps with those negative and cognitive symptoms. So if you go back to this slide, you notice here that normally serotonin would be acting on this uh, on this uh, neuron here and would have a negative effect. This would actually prevent more dopamine from being released. By blocking this, you end up increasing the amount of dopamine coming out, uh, and thus you can then have uh, more dopamine activity in the frontal cortex. You have less of those negative symptoms. You help with the cognitive symptoms. And the other thing here with this neuron being inhibitory, by having more dopamine acting here, you end up kind of decreasing some of the, the dopamine overactivity in the nucleus accumbens. So that helps a lot with those kind of positive symptoms as well. Okay. So even though it's ultimately less potent than your first generation agents, it can still help with those positive symptoms from that standpoint as well. So what are the adverse effects? Because again, these still have their own adverse effects, just not um, probably anything is quite as debilitating as something like a tardive dyskinesia. But uh, waking is going to be a pretty big deal. So I've seen some patients who get put on uh, these drugs and they gain 30, 40, 50 pounds, like no problem, right? Um, so you're going to see that olanzapine and clozapine are probably going to be the biggest offenders here, right? Um, so those are not going to be good kind of go-to drugs unless they kind of failed other ones. Um, but lowest you're going to see with something like zeprasidone or aripiprazole. I'll show you a slide that kind of gives the whole list in just a minute. Um, aripiprazole you might see being used more frequently um, for treatment-resistant depression. So that's one of the ones we mentioned you can sometimes we'll see on board with something like an SSRI to kind of help some of those really uh, depressed patients. But uh, if a patient has more than 5% weight gain, that's usually going to be recommended to switch them over to a different agent, right? Because again, uh, increased weight, you're going to have lots of other complications from that. So you can have worsen, um, you know, dyslipidemia, worsen hypertension, all those other problems you see with that. So that's why if you have really significant weight gain, probably switch them over to something else. Um, you can also see glucose intolerance. Um, so you can have patients potentially have new onset diabetes from this. Um, it's probably going to be worse with clozapine. And then hyperlipidemia can, uh, again, go along with all of these. Um, clozapine is going to be um, one of those ones you use really for treatment resistant patients. So once they failed several other therapies, then you can use clozapine because it has um, a black box warning on it. It has a RIMS program, right? That's that risk evaluation and mitigation strategy uh, program. So it's very similar to something like Accutane where you have to be registered with the program. The pharmacy has to be registered with the program. The physician has to be re registered with it. Um, and so because of the, uh, the agranulocytosis risk. So even though it's 1% incidence, um, there have been several patients who have developed very serious infection have died secondary to this. So uh, that's why they, they put that, that monitoring system in place. So you have to do um, you know, weekly monitoring, especially up front on your CBCs, to make sure you don't develop this. And then you know, as you get more stable, stabilized and you can kind of uh, extend out how often you need to do that. So just be aware this is really going to be more for resistant patients. Um, as in general, a lot of these can have QT prolongation effects. So especially if you were to like say overdose on this plus say something like, you guys remember the SSRI that can have effects on QT prolongation? Not Prozac, not Zola. So citalopram and escitalopram are the two ones. So Celexa and Lexapro, those are the two big ones that can cause QT prolongation. So um, again, if you had a patient who is depressed and psychotic and so they overdosed on all these medications, which is not uncommon, you can see synergistic effects for that QT prolongation. So definitely check an EKG to make sure they're not having any issues with that. Does Prozac not prolong it or it's just not as big as the others? It does not prolong it. Fluoxetine does not. 
Did you learn something different elsewhere? Yes. Citalopram and escitalopram, for my purposes. Okay. Clinically, that is also what you will see. <laughs> but if other people tell you otherwise, I would just remember that for that test. <laughs> Don't start any fights. Anyway, all right. Yeah, so, yeah, so escitalopram and citalopram are really the ones that cause QT prolongation, especially in overdose, especially when you have multiple meds that can, that can uh, have synergistic effects on that. So, um, like I said, it's not infrequent for a lot of these patients to take all of their, you know, their geodon, all of their uh, SSRI, you know, so their citalopram, you know, other meds that can also prolong QT. So this is where you really run into those problems where you can see at risk for, what arrhythmia? Torsades, yeah, it's a big one with QT prolongation. Okay, um, so orthostatic hypotension can also be uh, seen here as well. This is probably going to be more when you have this kind of big uh, bolus doses uh, of IV or IM uh, meds being given, so be aware of that. Um, and so those elderly patients are typically going to be typically more at risk. Okay, um, tolerance does develop over time, but just be aware, especially with the first couple of doses, they may see this being more pronounced. Um, they also have a black box warning associated with them. So this is kind of a general class effect that they have increased mortality in elderly patients with dementia related psychosis, right? So these are not to be used for patients who are just having sundowning and they are, you know, kind of acutely agitated due to that, right? That can lead to worsen suicide, or not suicidality, but just worsen uh, mortality in those patients in general. Uh, so be aware of that. Um, sometimes people kind of use that as kind of an easy go-to way to kind of calm down their patients and, and, and deal with that, but there is increased mortality there, so be, be aware. Um, Sedation is also going to be a very big effect for a lot of these medications, especially something like ketiapine, olanzapine, and clozapine. So we frequently we'll um, use these at, at, at nighttime, QHS dosing, in order to help mitigate that. So that way the patient's not in, the, you know, in a fog the entire day. Um, sometimes you'll see these being prescribed just for sleep, probably inappropriately. Um, so it's not uncommon to see Seroquel being given at nighttime as needed for, for sleep, which is probably inappropriate. But you may see it. Um, and then you can also see some anticholinergic effects similar to what you saw with some of the, the low potency dopamine blockers uh, in the first generation agents, but usually olanzapine and clozapine are probably going to be more prominent here. Um, so dry mouth constipation are very common with this as well. Okay. Um, seizures are not super common. This may be more at risk for patients who, who say overdose, something like that, but not, not super common, but they, they could be a risk with clozapine and olanzapine as well. As far as drug interactions go, um, typically these are going to be pharmacodynamic interactions. There's not a ton of uh, pharmacokinetic interactions like SIP inhibition and things like that. Um, essentially, though, if you're going to be combining meds that can have increased effects here, like sedation. So if I, I mix a benzodiazepine along with a, one of these second generation agents, you're going to see synergistic you know, CNS depression. If I mix, you know, an alpha blocker, say if I had a patient who's on trazodone for their depression uh, and they were taking Seroquel, for their, you know, schizophrenia, um, that can worsen the orthostatic hypotension risk. Because remember, trazodone is that one that has the alpha blocking effects. It's a good one to remember. Uh, and also the anticholinergic effects can be synergistic there as well. So um, if you were to include other dopamine blocking drugs on top of these, even though they don't really themselves cause a lot of dystonia, you can worsen those effects by combining drugs. So um, there's lots of drugs out there that will block dopamine receptors that you may not think of as dopamine blocking drugs. So one of the big ones is metoclopramide or Reglan. It's a common one we'll see used for nausea vomiting when we talk about the GI section. Uh, another one is going to be promethazine or phenergan, another common nausea vomiting uh, medication, right? Because we'll see when we talk about nausea vomiting that dopamine receptors are prominent uh, as a cause centrally for, for causing nausea and vomiting. So if you can block those receptors, you can also deal a lot, uh, with a lot of that. So be aware of those, of those interactions there, right? More dopamine blockade means more risk for EPS and dystonia. Okay, so here's your list uh, of drugs. Again, this list seems to get ever longer every year I update this, these slides, so there's lots of new ones always being added on. Um, so you can kind of see the list here, kind of some of the common ones. Because these drugs are becoming so frequently used, I would be familiar with all of these for, for possible testing purposes, right, the whole list. Because um, not only are you going to see them being used strictly for schizophrenia, but there's other places you can see them used as well. So what other kind of conditions do you think? I mentioned one of them already. Yeah, so treatment-resistant depression, so that's where you're going to see a Bilify or a Piperzole possibly being used, right? Sometimes I'll see it used for just like 
super out of control kids. Sometimes it's not uncommon to see kids who have kind of aggression disorders who are being placed on these medications. So consider that. So again, these don't just specifically get uh, prescribed for schizophrenia. Um, they can be prescribed for potential other mood disorders as well. So it kind of depends on the provider and kind of what they're, they're used to. So be aware of that. Um, note here that um, as far as you know, just know those kind of the more common side effects that we mentioned on the previous slides. I'm not going to ask you to, okay, was this one three stars or two stars uh, for dizziness? Like, I'm not going to ask you that. But just be aware uh, of their kind of general side effects you're going to see with these. Obviously, you know, things like tachycardia. It's going to be worse with things that have more anti-muscarinic effects, you know, things like that. Um, probably the big one to, to keep an eye on is going to be this weight gain category. Because, again, that's going to be a big reason for discontinuation. So olanzapine or Zyprexa is a huge one that can cause this. This is probably one of the worst ones that I've kind of come across. Um, certainly, Seroquel can do this as well. Um, but there's some that have very little weight gain associated with them. So those might be better options for your patients. So just be aware of that. Um, two of the ones I'm probably starting to see more frequently for uh, intramuscular use for acutely agitated patients um, are probably going to be Geodon or the Zyprasidone. And then also olanzapine or Zyprexa. So they have IM formulations available that you can give for uh, acutely agitated patients. Sometimes if you have kids who come in who are uh, to the, like the emergency department at the PEDS uh, ED who are autistic and they are you know acutely agitated and like you know, say for instance you know you're worried about meningitis and a kid that has autism and you need to do an LP and they are fighting you the whole way. Yeah, you know, sometimes you'll end up giving, having to give something like an IM dose to one of these just to like calm them down enough to where you can actually do the procedure you need to do. So um, may not just be used for patients with schizophrenia, it could be used for any kind of acute uh, agitation. Those IM routes are, are useful for that. Well, yep. Would we use this instead of like a benzo or something just to take it? Sometimes you see them used in combination. Um, so it would not be uncommon, it's like when I did my, my fellowship in, in the adult ED world, um, it would not be uncommon to have someone who is, say, acutely agitated, um, say they come off their meds and are relapsing really bad, um, to give them a benzodiazepine along with uh, a typical antipsychotic. So, so oftentimes you um, give them Haldol along with uh, Ativan or Lorazepam. So call it a little vitamin A and a little vitamin H to basically just knock them down. This first line for so it depends. Um, some patients, it depends on the provider in a lot of cases, what they want to do. So especially like, say for instance, uh, if I had someone who I knew this was going to be more of a schizophrenia related issue, this is more kind of a psychotic kind of, like, you know, it's more of a psychiatric kind of issue. Um, people tend to lean towards using one of these drugs, right? Because it helps to uh, hopefully kind of calm them down, get them kind of back to whatever their baseline normally is. Um, and that can kind of be useful for that. If it's something like drug induced psychosis, Say, for instance, they had just done a whole bunch of, of say, fencyclidine, PCP, or cocaine, or amphetamines, whatever it happens to be. Um, very frequently, I do not want to give them one of these drugs because I can worsen some of the effects. So I can worsen cardiac effects, you know, because I see QT prolongation. I can worsen, um, you know, you can see the seizure threshold being decreased, so there may be more at risk for seizures. That's where I like to go to benzos, right? For the kid who's freaking out because you want to stick a giant needle in his mm -hmm. back. You would still go over this? Um, it just depends. You know, so maybe sometimes they'll give them a dose of, uh, say, they'll try to do like intranasal, you know, uh, Versed or Midazolam. That may not be enough. You know, maybe sometimes you have to go and add on a second drug. You don't necessarily want to give them more benzos. You can try something like this. So it, a lot of it's on a case by case basis. It depends on kind of what the patient's presenting. Um, kind of pathology is, you know, what their other comorbid conditions are, what other medications are they on. A lot of that can interplay in, in your decision on what you want to give them. So unfortunately, it's one of those things like, it depends. Snowflakes. Just, yes, yeah, they're all snowflakes. They kind of are and they kind of aren't, but yeah, they're all snowflakes. We'll go with that. Um, some other second generation agents um, that I uh, was noticing, again, they're all going to have very similar side effects, but um, I probably will not ask quite as much on, on these ones just because they're newer, but I just added them on just for, for completeness sake. Uh, this is kind of a big booming business uh, as far as in, in the pharmaceutical world. So you're going to see newer agents coming out for these. Hopefully they'll kind of slow down a little bit, but it's kind of like, you know, the, the 19 different ACE inhibitors, right? For a while, ACE inhibitors were kind of like the new big thing. And so they just kept coming out with newer ones and newer ones. And then, you know, none of them really had any particular benefit over another, um, but it's just kind of, you know, all comes down to money in a lot of cases. But anywho, so this is the uh, newer ones you're going to see potentially out there. So um, going back to this slide, just again, to compare the side effects um, between the atypicals and the, the typical antipsychotics. Notice here you're going to see, um, 
those here that the EPS is going to be very low for all these agents. Um, you can still see some anticholinergic effects, but in, in general, it's going to be uh, you know, pretty comparable to what you see with the, the typical agents. Um, you know, seizure risk is going to be low for for majority of them. Notice here, no prolactin. Really very low amount of prolactin increases, and this is going to be due to uh, really that decrease in that dopamine receptor blockade. So just keep in mind, you know, if you were to say, you know, a patient comes in and they were complaining of, um, you know, shuffling gait and, you know, gynecomastia, and they're on haloperidol, what medication would be appropriate to switch them to, right? So if I put another high potency D2 blocker on there, you say, no, that's not right. Uh, if I put like a second generation agent that had, you know, kind of low dopamine receptor activity, that'd probably be a good one, right? So think about that. Think about why, you know, when you switch a medication, think about um, what are some good options for that, okay? Okay, so monitoring-wise, uh, again, monitor their weight. Again, usually a 5% increase is going to be grounds for, for switching them. Uh, blood pressure, you know, look at their glucose because typically glucose tolerance is going to be worsened. Uh, look at their lipids and then also all the other antipsychotic side effects. So, you know, monitor for EPS, even though it's a low risk, you do still want to monitor for those to make sure they're not developing uh, as time goes on. All right, so any questions on the first half that we talked about? I want to make them sing when they come in. No, no, no. No, no, no. We're all adults here. Well, we pretend to be, at least. Just kidding. Um, okay, so for acute treatment uh, of acute psychotic episodes, we've kind of uh, been talking about this a little bit already. Um, but again, the idea is mainly to kind of knock down their, their acute positive symptoms, right? It's like maybe some of these guys are having right here. You know, delusions of grandeur, possibly. Maybe. You know, just walking, strolling in late to class. You know? mm -hmm. Anywho. Um, also, just like we were talking about before, you may need some benzodiazepines to kind of help calm down the patient as well, right? So you may need to uh, do some combination therapy um, to, to help really just decrease and, and get that patient calm and kind of down to a place where they, they are manageable. Because again, these can be patients who for security guards are trying to hold them down, you're having a hog time just to get them restrained in order to give them an IM shot at anything, right? So these can be very, very difficult patients to manage in some cases. Um, but it is very funny. I remember I had one patient who's coming in who's um, who who is talking about um, you know he he traveled to several different universes and um, you know it was letting everyone in the emergency department know about it at the top of his lungs and and being very violent with some some people. So he's finally in restraints and so he's just going on and on and on. Finally the the nurse finally had the the you know the haloperidol drawn up to to finally put him down. And it's so funny just hearing him talk about going through the cosmos and then all of a sudden just he goes to sleep. <laughs> it's like, oh, it's so much more peaceful in here now. So, um, yeah, so very effective for that. But again, uh, you may need to titrate your dose uh, as, as tolerated or as efficacious for your patient. So just be aware of that. Um, be aware of the side effects. So again, if they have an acute dystonic reaction, how to treat that as well. Um, and again, uh, if, if they're having no changes in symptoms, um, you know, in three to four weeks, then that's a probably a good sign you need to try switching over to something else. Every patient is going to react a little bit differently to these meds, especially with side effects and, and efficacy. So be aware of that. Um, you have a patient who has a compliance issue, uh, this is where you need to consider a long-acting injectable form. So we mentioned a few of these already, but haloperidol is kind of the, the um, probably the more common one back in the day, um, but now they're coming out with more uh, long-acting like elanzapine, risperidone, all of those ones can be uh, utilized. And again, it provides a nice couple months, usually like three months at a time worth of therapy, uh, where that way they're, they're forced, to, uh, forced to have compliance at that point. So, um, Here's an idea. So this is kind of like a suggested schizophrenia algorithm for pharmacotherapy. So um, based on kind of the staging, based on on kind of just how severe their symptoms are, you can see how um, you know they are uh, how, basically kind of the algorithm you're going to go through in order to select your medication. So um, in general, you're going to see that, especially for patients who are kind of treatment naive, or maybe this is their first episode, using a second generation is always going to be your, your go-to, right? You always want to start off with one of these just due to the fact that you lose a lot of those uh, EPS and those other kind of anti-dopamine Kind of side effects. So um, good ones to start out with are going to be like aripiprazole, or your Abilify, uh, Risperidone, or Risperdal, or Ziprasidone. Um, those are all going to be good ones to start with. They don't have a ton of the weight gain associated with them or a ton of the sedation and all of that. So those are those are good options, right? Um, you know, if the patient has you know previously been treated with antipsychotic, um, you know, you can consider looking at to see what they've been on previously, what worked for them. Try switching over to another agent, possibly. You really don't want to use clozapine unless they've failed several therapies, right? Because it's just so much more labor intensive as far as monitoring goes in order to, to keep a patient on clozapine because of that agranulocytosis risk. So then, um, you know, uh, under, usually you don't need to consider using two antipsychotics at the same time. You're only ever going to increase your risk for side effects at that point. Um, so really just try to optimize your dose uh, or switch to an agent that's going to work better for your patient. So just think about that. 
Um, so then obviously you're going to be, um, you know, trialing out different medications. You know, if they've already failed two, this is where you can kind of consider to use clozapine and as monotherapy. Um, and so this is kind of like a third line type agent you'd be using. Um, obviously, if there's compliance issues, long acting injectables can be utilized here to see how they're going to respond to that. So this is going to be pretty, pretty useful in that cir uh, circumstance. Again, whenever you can, you want to try to minimize the dose they're going to receive. So if you have like really well controlled symptoms, maybe some side effects, you can try titrating down as you can to see how they, they tolerate. But you just really got to track their symptoms and, and, and see how it goes from there. So, okay. So, any questions on on that as far as like how to how to select a therapy and, and go from there? Okay. Um, usually, if you need to discontinue therapy for whatever reason, um, usually you want to do a taper. Otherwise, you can increase their chance of having a relapse. Um, so usually over two weeks or so. Um, and if you start to have any kind of like withdrawal type of effects, so they start to have kind of increase in their in their uh, symptoms they're having previously, then you can kind of titrate back up on your dose to get them back at a baseline and then kind of restart your taper from there. Then you go a little bit slower. Um, typically, if you're switching between two different agents, you don't want to just stop one and then start the other. Um, what you can usually do is actually start to titrate down on the first one uh, over a two-week period, and then you start at the second one at a low dose and start to titrate up on that. So that way they kind of have consistent coverage. Um, and it's a little bit more of a gentle transition for them rather than kind of going cold turkey from one to the other. So it's uh, somewhat useful for, for those patients. Um, some other withdrawal symptoms you can see. So certainly they can have things like insomnia because usually these are going to be sedating medications anyway. So kind of reversing that effect can see I can see that happen. Um, maybe some restlessness and GI symptoms. Um, and because if they're losing those anticholinergic effects they've had around for a long period of time, you can see some of the increased salivation and sweating uh, that can occur as that. Right. So all of this is basically uh, linked back to their pharmacology. So any questions on schizophrenia? <laughs> Um, if memory serves correctly, I think like the haloperidol is three months worth. Um, I'd have to double check on the other ones. And then how do you taper that? Or will they go, like, do you think the prep for it coming from the shop, will they go into the withdrawal? Um, there's a potential, but again, because it's going to be a much kind of a slower tapering effect for them, um, they would not be as likely to experience kind of an acute withdrawal because of that, right? Because the drug is just going to kind of taper off on its own. But um, those might be for patients who hopefully have like a little bit better control over either they have like caregivers that can like help kind of coordinate and bring them in or if they're like living like an assisted living facility or something where they have a little bit more control over that um hopefully they're, they're not going to miss their doses but it all depends on the patient and for these im drugs do you do it like a trial run of a couple of weeks or longer of oral meds to see how they react before you give them this long acting yeah because what's the problem given a long acting im drug mm -hmm. Once it's in. Oh, yeah, once it's in, it's in, right? So um, I told you guys that story about the lady who overdosed on buprenorphine, um, and she normally did methadone and threw herself into withdrawal. Yeah. So the same thing can happen with, like, an IM shot to, of buprenorphine. Like, there's actually, like, you know, intramuscular versions you can get. And that was a, a case where that had ha same thing happened to, to another patient like that with an IM shot of buprenorphine, and, and you can't take that back. Like, you know, it's, it's there. Um, so, yeah, so this would be something where you would find kind of what works for them orally. If you know they have compliance issues, then that's where you can trial out the IM. Right, so it's not the first go-to, but it's something you can certainly use um, once you kind of know what, what works for them. Yeah, and keep in mind like there's the different formulations. So, so for instance, if I was going to use like an IM dose of haloperidol for an acute agitation, that is different from the long-acting form. The long-acting form normally comes like kind of like an oil base um, that you can use intramuscularly. If I were to give that IV, you're more likely to see like embolism because no one likes oils in, in the bloodstream. Um, but by giving that in an in intramuscular form, um, it causes a slow release of drug over time. So that's safe, right? Um, but the other form, you would you could potentially give IV. It's not really marketed for that, but it's neither here nor there. Any other questions on schizophrenia? Okay, moving on. Uh, we'll talk about some anxiolytics. You guys probably use some of these maybe like before a test or something like that, right? Okay, um, lots of different uh, anxiety disorders. Um, you can generalize anxiety disorder. You can have social anxiety disorder. Um, I, I used to have OCD so bad I had CDO. Um, that, was, that was a rough time. Um, PTSD, all kinds of different uh, varieties of anxiety that can pop up. So uh, as far as pathophysiology, this is really kind of a maladaptive response to these stressful stimuli. So whether it be a public speaking engagement or whether it be a big test coming up or whatever, basically you're having kind of an imbalance between two active norepinephrine, serotonin, mono means like that, and then not enough uh, GABA activity. So you're going to see a lot of the, the drugs we're going to use uh, for anxiety will be helping to kind of reset this point or re-regulate a lot of these effects here. There'll also be uh, some HPA axis abnormalities, but um, 
we'll kind of not really be dealing with that so much with the pharmacotherapy. That could also be possible pathophysiology as well. So uh, drugs that can cause anxiety. So this is important. So if your patient is experiencing acute anxiety, maybe some of the medications are taking. So what are some of those that can, you can see? Um, one of the ones being antipsychotics. We already mentioned the akathisia you could see there. So that can be manifesting itself as kind of an anxiety. As we mentioned, you know, um, uh, people feel like they just want to crawl out of their skin. They just want to just, you know, rip the clothes off. You know, they're, just, they're very anxious about all of that. Um, so that could be one cause. Um, certainly stimulants, sympathomimetics, you know, certainly things like, you know, Sudafed or amphetamines, cocaine, all of that can potentially cause it. Hallucinogens are a big one. Um, um, and then um, some other things that can cause symptoms of anxiety, uh, just through the actual um, increase of the sympathomimetic uh, nervous system. So things like stimulants can certainly do that. Withdrawal from things like medications, uh, ethanol, opioids, benzodiazepines, all of that withdrawal can also manifest itself as anxiety as well, right? So you're having kind of a ramped up sympathetic nervous system uh, leading to a lot of the same signs and symptoms you see with anxiety. So, um, Supportive therapy is obviously going to be the first line treatment. So, again, um, trying to deal with whatever the actual cause of the anxiety is. So, um, you know, if you can be better prepared for a test and maybe you're not quite so nervous or whatever kind of coping strategies the patients can use. Um, and then you get down to the pharmacotherapy. So, for acute anxiety, you can always use a benzodiazepines. We'll talk more about those in detail. Um, more chronic management of anxieties, this is going to be better suited for SSRIs and other antidepressants, right? Um, you don't want to use benzodiazepines all the time we're going to see there's some drawbacks to doing that. So really the antidepressants are better for chronic anxiety. Acute anxiety is better with benzodiazepines. And then we'll look at some uh, alternative agents. Um, sometimes you can use things like buspirone, which we'll talk more about in detail, and then rarely some of the second generation antipsychotics. You guys know of any other medications you can use, like say, uh, you know, you're going to give a big public speech? Propanol. Yeah, propanol is a big one. So beta blockers can be another good option. We'll talk about those as well. So antidepressants are going to be effective for uh, both acute and long-term treatment of generalized anxiety disorder. This can also be very useful if your patient has a component of depression on top of this. Um, you know, very frequently I see a lot of people, you know, they may not necessarily have depression, so to speak. They just have really just bad anxiety that kind of manifests itself as, as a form of depression. So there's a lot of interplay there. Um, and, and you'll see the antidepressants work for kind of both components of this, which is really nice. You know, I had people that describe it as me as like, yeah, I just didn't really care so much anymore. You know, it's like, yeah. A bunch of dirty clothes on the floor. She didn't really care so much before it would have caused huge amounts of anxiety for that person, right? So just be aware of that that can um, can be very useful for those. Um, some of the FDA approved agents, you'll see uh, some things like venlafaxine or duloxetine. What class did those fall into? Yeah, it's SNRI. So it's your serotonin, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors or selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. Yep, this is fall in that category. And then your just regular SSRIs can be useful as well. So paroxetine, escitalopram, um, really any of the SSRIs can be can be useful here. These are just ones with, with actual FDA approved uh, indications. And then imipramine, and we know what type of drug that is. That's a tricyclic antidepressant. So that can sometimes be used uh, second line, but that's you're going to have higher side effects, right? Anytime you're using those anti, um, uh, the TCAs, have more anticholinergic effects or you know, alpha-1 blocking effects, so you don't want to necessarily use those unless you need to. Um, we don't necessarily know the full mechanism for how these antidepressants are going to work. It's thought to maybe help with uh, helping to reset some of these stress-adapting pathways. And keep in mind, these are not going to be effective immediately. So if someone had a big speech they needed to give in an hour, antidepressants are not going to be useful for them, right? That's where something like a benzodiazepine or something like propranolol is going to be a lot better for them. Okay, because those are going to have more immediate effects. Antidepressants take time. Um, and of course, we not already know the antidepressant side effects. We've uh, talked about those previously. Again, those will um, still be game for, for the test. So benzodiazepines, this is a new group of medications that we've alluded to uh, several times. And so they're going to be working by helping to enhance the effects of GABA, right? So you have the GABA uh, receptors. And what do those do on the neurons? inhibit it, right? So they help to increase chloride influx into the neurons, which is going to lower that electronegativity. And it's going to make it more difficult for those neurons to fire, right? Because again, what's normally like the big ion that causes uh, an action potential in those neurons? Sodium is a big one, right? So when we talk about the neurology section, we talk about anti-epileptics. Sodium's a big, um, sodium blockers are going to be a big uh, role to play in that. Benzodiazepines can help here as well because, you know, a seizure is just overactive neuron firing, right? Neuronal firing. You're just having this inappropriate firing of it, very similar to what you see like with an arrhythmia. So anything you can do to hyperpolarize those cells and limit those action potentials is going to help to limit that. So uh, very similar thing we're doing here. And so what you can see is that the, uh, the GABA receptors 
are made up of multiple different subunits. And so there's actually a benzodiazepine binding site specifically on the GABA receptor. And so we're going to see here that there's a GABA A and a GABA B receptor. We mentioned the GABA B receptors already when we talked about muscle relaxants, right, in the pain section. These are mainly going to be working GABA A receptors, okay? So essentially, the benzodiazepine will go and bind on this site right here on the, on the GABA receptor. This is going to make GABA work better, which will help to enhance the opening of this receptor here and allow more chloride to flow in, unless you're going to hyperpolarize that cell, right? So that's how it causes inhibition, how it causes the CNS depression by hyperpolarizing those neurons. Make sense? So again, it does not directly open the channel. It just helps GABA to work better, which is why, say, if you had a condition where um, a patient had no GABA, so say, for instance, they had overdosed on isoniazid, or um, there's some mushrooms that can also cause a similar thing. Isoniazid is normally used to treat what? TB, yeah. So TB, isoniazid, TB drug. Uh, if someone had overdosed on that, you can actually decrease the amount of GABA you're producing in the brain. And so if I were to give a benzodiazepine to that patient, how well do you think it would work? Not very well at all, because there's no GABA around, right? So there are some drugs that will directly open up that channel. This is not one of them, okay? They're just enhancing the, the effects of GABA already there. So lots of different available agents here. Um, I noted the ones in yellow here as being uh, IV agents, but these all could be potential ones that can come up on, on the test. So be aware, be familiar with all these different drugs here. So um, certainly lots of ones um, you guys are probably familiar with, so like Xanax, the Zany bars, right? Uh, Alprazolam is a big one. Um, chloride diazepoxide used to be, it's actually the first benzodiazepine that used to be used a lot for prevention of withdrawal from ethanol and prevention of DTs. Um, this Clobazam or Onfi, this is actually a newer uh, seizure agent that we use uh, with some frequency in, in PEDS patients. Um, but yeah, so these are kind of your go-to IV agents, and that'll be important when we talk about um, seizure management. Um, this is also important for like kind of acute um, anxiety issues. This is, this is useful as well. So diazepam, lorazepam, and midazolam are our go-tos there. Hmm? The, um, asterisks? the asterisks are the ones that are going to be better for elderly patients. Thank you for mentioning that. So, um, so if you look at the beers list, you guys remember what the beers list is, right? What's that? Right. So it's not like when you go to like Orlando Brewing and see the list there. It's not that. Uh, so the ones you don't want to get older patients, right? Um, so there are certain ones, and we'll look at the pharma, uh, pharmacokinetics of these agents, but certain ones are better for older patients because of organ dysfunction, liver dysfunction, renal dysfunction. And so these are called the LOT benzodiazepines, or the L-O-T-T. -T, so you can see the lorazepam, oxazepam, temazepam, and triazolam. Those are all going to be the, the ones that are safer to use in elderly patients. We'll talk about why that is just a little bit later. So other uses you'll see, um, if they are having seizures, this is good for them. Uh, acute agitation, this can also be useful as well. Um, one of the newer things we're doing with uh, benzodiazepines is actually using a lot more intranasal midazolam or Versed. Um, it's being very uh, frequently used, especially in cases where you do not have IV access. So um, especially in the kind of pre-hospital setting with like EMS, we're starting to use more intranasal midazolam. We don't have IV access for seizure patients. And we're also using it in the hospital for, say, a patient who is... Um, you know, a small child who is either getting IV placed and they're very freaked out about it, or say they have like a laceration, they need a suture, they can actually calm them down quite a bit by using some intranasal Versed and then doing like a digital block, you know, whatever happens to be, uh, or any kind of block there. So um, very frequently used for, for acute agitation uh, and, and anxiety. Um, you can also use it as a muscle relaxant. So again, this is going to be depressing all the neurons in the CNS, so you can see it uh, working on, on muscle spasms as well. And then we we'll use it for sedation. Um, so say you have like an intubated patient, um, you know, obviously being on, on, a, uh, on a ventilator is not a very comfortable thing for patients, right? So you need to give them something to calm them down and, and put them to sleep, essentially, to let them be kind of synchronous with the ventilator. So it's very frequently you'd give them a drip, a uh, continuous drip of, say, like Versed or Midazolam plus fentanyl. That's right? a common one. Or uh, We'll talk about some other agents when we get to the surgery section, right? Lots of uses for these drugs. Um, and so the, the kinetics of it, you can see that the onset will be dependent on the lipophilicity of the drug. So um, if you're thinking about lipophilicity and you're thinking about where these drugs are working, which which organ is it mainly working on? Brain. The brain, right? And so what do you need to cross to get to the brain? Blood, Blood brain barrier, absolutely. So um, do you think something is more lipophilic or less lipophilic will cross easier? More lipophilic, right? So it's going to cross easier if it's more lipophilic. It also is going to leave more easily if it's more uh, lipophilic, right? So it can cross, kind of cross that barrier much more easily. So um, if you look at something like diazepam 
requires a pain. They have high lipid solubility, which means that they have very fast onset of action. So even if you give an oral dose, onset of action can be within 30, 60 minutes, right? IV doses work, uh, especially fast, you know, within a minute or two should be getting most of your effects. So you see a more rapid and intense effect, but it also means you have a shorter duration of action. What's nice, though, is if you give something with like a lower lipophilicity, so oxazepam, lorazepam is another good one, too, uh, from an IV option, where you can actually give that, and it takes it more time to cross the blood-brain barrier to get to the CNS, but it also sticks around for longer there because it's a harder time leaving. So that means that even though it takes a little bit longer to have its effects, it sticks around for longer, which is really good for seizures if you're trying to prevent recurrent seizures from happening, right? So that's why we like lorazepam for acute management of seizures. So um, obviously IV is going to work a lot faster than PO, so just be aware of that. Um, and then know that CYP3A4 is responsible for metabolizing a lot of the benzodiazepines, right? Um, especially, um, uh, or except for lorazepam, clonazepam, and oxazepam. So this is beneficial, especially remember that L and the O, those lot benzodiazepines that are on this list, that's useful for patients who have hepatic dysfunction or have other concomitant meds that are inhibiting CYP3A4, because otherwise you run into the risk of seeing excess sedation happening there. Um, so that's one of the things to keep in mind. Um, some of the drugs will have active metabolites, which means they get broken down into products that are still active and can still cause some um, CNS depression. So for those older patients who either have hepatic dysfunction, so we're not breaking them down very well, they're gonna have higher levels of the parent drug, or if they have poor renal dysfunction, they may not be able to clear it as well from the kidneys, um, they can see over sedation. So that's why lorazepam, oxazepam, temazepam, and triazolam are the best ones because they're more water-soluble. Uh, they're going to be more likely to be uh, eliminated through the kidneys more easily, and they also do not have active metabolites uh, available. So those are kind of the, the big uh, reasons why we go with those drugs for older patients. So obviously adverse effects. Um, CNS depression is going to be the biggest thing. So you can see ataxia, you can see nystagmus basically doing the same thing as alcohol does. So someone who's using a benzodiazepine can very much appear drunk, right? So that's kind of the same thing we're seeing there. Um, tolerance can certainly be seen with this. So someone who is on benzodiazepines will develop tolerance of those sedative effects over time, right? So you may need to increase your dose in order to see the same kind of effects you were looking for uh, from uh, previously. And then uh, we mentioned, I kind of mentioned, talked about this on the break, but uh, there's this idea of a paradoxical reaction. Does anyone know what that is? Yeah, so you give a kid, uh, so this happens more often in children, um, but basically you give, uh, uh, say, a child a dose of a benzodiazepine. The same thing happens with Benadryl, um, where you give them a dose and, and they, you'd expect them to get more sleepy. They end up freaking out. They, they get really kind of uh, agitated and aggressive and they're running around like crazy. And you're like, what the heck is going on? This drug is doing the exact opposite of what I wanted it to do. And the way I kind of liken that is uh, if you imagine if you're out, uh, you know, on a social occasion and you have a drink or two, are you immediately like passed out? No, you're usually like a little bit more social, you can go talk to people, your inhibitions are a little bit limited. You know, that, that's similar to what some of these doses of benzos are doing to these kids. You're kind of um, taking the brakes off the system a little bit to allow some of these excitatory neurons to be more active, okay? But then if I were to say have five or six drinks, might be a little bit more sleepy at that point, right? Same thing happens with benzodiazepines. If you have a kid who's having a paradoxic reaction, you can give more benzos and that will knock them out, okay? So just be aware of that, um, but it's important to ask, you know, have they ever received these drugs before? You know, what's their reaction been? Um, because that can key you in if you should maybe try it, even try it in the first place or avoid it entirely. Okay, so it's not a, an allergy. It's not a reason to never give the drug again. It's just a, a known side effect you can sometimes see with kids. Is it same with adults, like with the psych patients when they give them an injection and they start freaking out, you just give them another one? Um, it's not frequently, frequently you see that with adults, um, but yeah, so it could be, especially if you were to give like, say a very small dose, uh, you may be more likely to see that, but normal treatment doses, you don't really run into that problem. Yeah. But potentially you should give them more and they would calm down. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, certainly see some memory impairment, which is why these are nice in kind of like the surgical or procedural setting. Cause you can help with, uh, that kind of anterograde amnesia. So it can kind of help you, um, forget some of the, the activities that were going on beforehand. Um, and of course these will have synergistic effects with, out, uh, ethanol and other CNS depressants. So you can see lots of, of increased CNS depression. Um, these drugs are very, very safe by themselves. Um, it's very, difficult to kill yourself uh which is overdosing on benzodiazepines you'd probably have to be hit by the truck delivering the meds um <laughs> for it to happen but once you have this mixed with other cns depressants that's where you start to see more respiratory depression that's where you start to see more um you know pot potential loss of airway protection things like that so um that's where you run into problems when you start to mix and match drugs so um withdrawal uh, from these are uh you know we said withdrawal from opioids is, is that ever fatal 
No, it's not. All right, they're going to wish they were dead, but they're not going to die, right? How about withdrawal from benzodiazepines? Absolutely, right? So someone who's been on benzodiazepines chronically, um, they can have withdrawal seizures. Very, very dangerous. So um, they can uh, develop agitation, tremor, sweating, all the same things you would see with like an opioid withdrawal, but the seizures here are the big problem. So if you imagine, if you have overactivity uh, of, of GABA uh, in the CNS due to the benzodiazepine effects, what do those receptors like to do? Well, they should downregulate over time, right? Because you're having overactivity, so you're going to start to downregulate those. If I all of a sudden pull away those benzo effects, now what happens? Well, eventually they'll all start to upregulate, but acutely, you still have fewer number of GABA receptors, and you still need to have those uh, neurons not be overactive. And so, if I don't have enough GABA receptors now to work, that's going to lead to those cells to be those neurons to be overactive. They're going to fire more action potentials. That's where you see seizures, right? So that's one of the big risks you see with benzodiazepine withdrawal. Same thing with ethanol withdrawal, right? Um, both of those could be potentially fatal due to the seizure aspect of it. So um, just be aware of that. Make sure you titrate patients off of these drugs slowly. Make sure you're kind of mitigating a lot of those withdrawal effects you're seeing there. Um, so very frequently, say like in the ICU, it's not uncommon for patients who are, say, uh, ventilated for a long period of time who are on those fentanyl and uh, midazolam drips to put them on tapers of both uh, benzodiazepines and opioids to make sure they don't go into withdrawal effect, uh, go into withdrawal, right? So um, important consideration. Um, same reason why you don't want a patient going to DTs in your, in your emergency department when they get sober is because of the seizure risk, okay? So the big problem there. So be aware. Um, another drug you can use uh, for sedate or for anxiety is going to be buspirone or buspar. This is a non-benzodiazepine anxiolytic. Um, doesn't really have any, any anticonvulsant effect. Or it doesn't not really produce any kind of dependence or impairment properties. Um, oh, this, for instance, um, does anyone know what schedule the benzodiazepines are? What federal schedule? It's not two. No, it doesn't have that big of abuse potential. It should be four. Yeah, so they're all four. So similar to like the barbiturates when we talk about those in, in neurology. But um, buspirone, though, is, is a non-controlled substance because you really don't see any kind of that dependence associated with it. So um, this one is going to be kind of second line for generalized anxiety disorder um, because of its kind of lack of consistent effect. Like the benzos are really good for kind of acute um, anxiety. SSRIs are going to be really good for more kind of chronic management of this, but buspar can be used as kind of a backup if those are not being effective. Um, typically takes around two weeks or so for it to really start to see efficacy. So this, uh, is chronic. Hmm. this is good for chronic. This is more chronic. This is not good for acute um, anxiety, right? Um, mechanism we don't really fully know, but it's thought to uh, be a partial agonist of this 5-HT1A receptor, which may be uh, helping to, it's an autoreceptor that may help to inhibit uh, further release of serotonin. So uh, it's pretty well tolerated by the most part, um, not a whole ton of side effects, and then uh, it's metabolized by CYP3A4, so you may see some increased toxicity if you had some inhibitors on board. Other drugs we can use, beta blockers, right? So it's not just propranolol, other beta blockers could also be useful here. Um, these are not working to actually decrease the sensation of anxiety up in the CNS, but they work on the peripheral effects, uh, especially by uh, decreasing the amount, you know, because you have the flight or flight response. Uh, and so by decreasing the effects of those catecholamines out in the periphery, you decrease a lot of those effects. So I say like the tremor you see on the, uh, the effects of the catecholamines on the skeletal muscle, those get limited, you see less sweating, all those sort of things, you can and decrease the heart rate. All those things are going to be good for decreasing the acute effects of um, of anxiety. So you see this more in performance-based situations. Um, you can use propranolol, but certainly things like atenolol can be used, metoprolol, other agents can be used as well. So just be aware of that. Um, and you want to take it one hour prior to the performance, right? You don't want to take it 30 minutes prior to, because then the drug's not going to have time to really kick in. So you don't want to take it like eight hours beforehand, because then a lot of the effects are already going to have wear it off. So be aware of the timing of that. You want to do it one hour beforehand. And let them know to do a test dose before they actually do it for real. Because you don't want to have someone that has, you know, really bad, say, hypotension associated with this. And all of a sudden they're, like, way too dizzy to even give the presentation or do the performance, right? That would be pretty bad. So do a test dose at home, say, the day before. And then do it one hour before the actual uh, time that the, whatever the, the event is, right? So I always have a bone to pick with this because um, I felt that... Um, these can be considered performance-enhancing drugs, and so when I was in pharmacy school, I remember the the scariest part of school was uh, a class we had called pharmacotherapy, where essentially you're sitting in a class full of 50 people, um, and so there was like a, a, a fake patient that was down there that you got called on to go and answer. You know, you had to interview them and ask questions, and then afterwards there was like a verbal defense session where basically you had to come up with a you know come up with a soap note and, and had to defend your plan with the the content experts. So you'd have like you know cardiac ICU 
pharmacists who are grilling you and all the guidelines and stuff. It's very, very nerve wracking because it was completely at random who got called on. Um, and so I had people, I knew classmates who were taking propranolol beforehand. And I was like, you sons of guns, like you're, you're going to be able to perform better than me because I'm sitting here just sweating up a storm and you know, just no good. So anyway, so that was uh, one of my kind of, uh, inadequacies in school, but anywho, um, <laughs> can be useful. Um, just be aware of, you know, contraindications. So, um, you know, if your patient had asthma, use one's going to be more cardio selective. Um, you know, you don't want to be blocking those beta two receptors, uh, and be aware of some like the, you know, the risk of like masking hypoglycemia for diabetic patients and, and things like that. So just be aware of that. So, um, general approach, if you're having urgent symptoms, benzodiazepines are going to be good, especially if it's, you know, say like an acute, you know, say over two to four weeks, that, that's probably appropriate. Uh, and then you want to begin concurrently in SSRI or SNRI therapy as well. Okay. Uh, for non-urgent symptoms, just start the SNRI or SSRI uh, to help uh, give them time to kind of get to, to manage that. If you're having inadequate response to one agent, press switching over to another, that's totally appropriate. Um, and if they're still kind of failed two therapies, then that's when you can try a TCA like a mepramine might be a, a possibility there. Yeah. Any questions on anxiety? You guys feeling more calm now? Learned all about it? Now to treat it? Maybe? No? Okay. Well, uh, then we'll, we'll pick you back up. We'll stimulate you with our ADHD meds. Okay, so um, as far as treatment goes, you know, I'm not have a lot with the, the pathophysiology because there's not a uh, super uh, lot there to talk about. But um, as far as treatment goes, it's really important to, to set specific goals for your patients, right? Um, so what does that mean for, for, you know, it depends on the patient you're talking about. So if it's, you know, a child, you know, can they sit still in a chair for 20 minutes? Can they complete their homework? You know, whatever happens to be, you want to set goals for that and, and titrate your dose of your meds in order to accomplish that. Um, obviously, non-pharmacologic therapy is going to be uh, beneficial here. So again, educational and cognitive behavioral interventions are always going to be preferred. Um, I probably think that kids get prescribed way too much uh, ADHD meds. Just seeing them come into uh, Nemours, it seems like just about every kid is on some sort of some sort of amphetamine uh, there. Uh, so it could be kind of self-selecting, um, little selection bias there. But uh, just be aware that it probably gets prescribed pretty pretty frequently, maybe, maybe not always, uh, you know, is uh, consistently uh, with the guidelines, but it gets used quite frequently. So you, you'll definitely see it out there. And again, more p adult patients are being uh, prescribed these as well. So again, be aware of the interactions that are going to happen here, how this is exacerbating their other comorbid conditions, because um, this can be important when you're trying to figure out why can't you get their blood pressure under control? Well, it could be because of the amphetamine they're taking, right? So be aware of that. <laughs> So um, stimulants are going to be your first line. Um, their main mechanism of action is going to be either by blocking monoamine oxidase, which we know is important for catal um, uh, metabolizing things like uh, norepinephrine, epinephrine. Um, they also will have some activity to block the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine, which of course when we block the reuptake of dopamine, what can that lead to? That's right, addiction. Right, so again, this is uh, uh, these are controlled substances. And most of these are going to be Schedule Two medications because there is abuse potential with them. Okay, um, so be aware of that. Um, and then the amphetamines themselves can actually directly increase catecholamine release from the neuron. So anything, all these things are doing is, is helping to increase the sympathomimetic uh, response uh, in order to help try to focus the patient in on whatever the task is at hand instead of just you know kind of looking at every shiny thing that pops up. Right. Um, just because you fail one particular type of amphetamine product does not mean the other ones are not going to be uh, effective. So, for instance, if you had a patient who was uh, failing dexmethylphenidate, does not mean they're not going to respond well to dextroamphetamine. So, there's lots of different varieties that are out there. Um, you can try out multiple ones to see how they, how they respond to it. Um, a lot of these are available in extended release preparations, which are nice because instead of having to worry about dosing it two to three times a day, um, this is much more beneficial for, for the patient, especially if they're going to school. You give them a dose in the morning, send them off instead of having to worry about the school nurse having to administer it uh, partway throughout the day, right? That's one of the benefits there. Um, there are also some patches that are available as well that kind of provide some kind of consistent release uh, throughout the day as well. So um, what are the stimulants we can see being used? Um, these are going to be our amphetamine-based products. So you'll have methylphenidate. Notice there's lots of different um, uh, brain names that are going to be associated with this. So uh, it's a lot of times just easier just to look them up when you, when you find the, and they tell you I'm on Concerta or I'm on whatever, because a lot of these will get mixed up based on their names. Um, it's really fun that they try to patch that it's going to be a nice controlled release um, product for, for them as well. Um, dextromethylphenidate will be focalin. You'll have your mixed amphetamine salts. That basically just means it's a mixture of amphetamine and dextroamphetamine. 
Okay, so you can see that there. And then there's also list dexamphetamine, which actually is a pro drug that gets converted over into dextroamphetamine. So, can you guys think of any potential benefits for giving a pro drug for one of these? Yeah, that's specifically it. So people do not snort um, the drug. So a lot of these extended release preparations, especially if you crush them up and snort them, you break the extended release, you get all the dose uh, immediately. So you get a nice, nice little high from that, right? So the idea was if you give a pro drug, if I crush this up and then snort it, it's not active yet, and it still is going to take a lot longer time to get to the liver to um, get metabolized into the active product. So does that always work? Who knows? But that was the initial intent for, for giving that pro drug of that. Um, but again, it's a very popular one, so you see a lot of patients are on Vivans, but that's kind of what the initial intent was. Um, but who knows if it actually um, cuts down on abuse or not. Um, but again, these are all amphetamine-based. They're all going to be C2, so that means they have a high abuse potential, according to the government, uh, which means there are a lot more restrictions on how you prescribe these. Okay. Adverse effects you're going to see, um, you can certainly see reduced appetite and weight loss. Um, so again, that could be problematic for especially for children, especially if they're already thin to begin with. Um, GI upset, insomnia, right? So this is why you frequently will see patients who are also being given medications at nighttime to help them sleep. So especially if they are, you know, kind of ramped up from taking their stimulants throughout the day, they might be on another medication at night. We'll talk about some of those in just a little bit. Um, tachycardia, hypertension can also be seen here as well. So again, if your patient has pre-existing hypertension, that can be worse uh, as well. Um, there's a black box warning on these uh, for psychotic episodes, hallucinations, and abuse and dependence. So just like we saw, you know, patients with uh, schizophrenia, they had dopamine hyperactivity leading to positive symptoms. Same thing can happen here, right? So this is where you can have those hallucinations come from. Um, and the dependence issues also can be related to that dopamine as well. So again, these are not benign medications. Uh, they can certainly be problematic for some patients, especially when they're on high doses for long periods of time. Okay, uh, some really good articles out there. To, you know, some patients who who get addicted to this stuff. It's uh, pretty interesting. Um, I have a funny story though. Uh, I had one uh, friend. We were in undergrad and we we're taking uh, anatomy and physiology, and so we we're doing our anatomy lab. So that's where you get to dissect the cat, right? And so we had our final where there's basically you walk into a room full of dead cats everywhere, and I think it sounds like a horror movie or something, but it was our test. So um, the night before, one of my friends uh, decided he had figured out he had not studied at all for this test. And so he said, I'm going to take half of an Adderall in order to help me study all night. And then I'll go in the morning, 8 o'clock, do the lab, and then we're set. So the next morning, he showed up uh, at my door, and I'd never seen someone so acutely agitated in my life at that point, right? Complete just flight of thought at every moment. So he was like, all right, we're going to study this. We're going to talk about this muscle. And we're going to talk about this muscle, blah, blah, blah. And just would not stop talking the entire time until we got in for the test. Sure enough, he could not focus on anything. Ended up failing the entire lab, had to redo it. All right. So be aware. Sometimes people can have some negative reactions to these medications, uh, especially if the dose is not really uh, tailored to them. You know, he could have been taking it from someone who had a much higher dose prescribed to them. Uh, and he was kind of a little guy to begin with. So uh, it was problematic for him, right? So just be aware of that. Some of those side effects you can see when, when patients are taking these inappropriately. Okay. So we mentioned the high abuse potential. It's related back to that dopamine uh, effect. So be aware of patients who have a prior history of substance abuse that can be problematic. And you can see some withdrawal effects. So if you imagine, you know, benzodiazepines causing rebound anxiety and, and, and sweating and, and hypertension and tachycardia, what do you think withdrawal from these agents would look like? Yeah, they're going to be a little bit more sedate. They're going to be kind of just have an avalition and just, just kind of lay around while, you know, so it's it's not as dramatic as you would see with some of these other uh, medications, but certainly withdrawal effects are there. Um, and there could be some control or some risk for, for growth stunting. There's some concern about that. So um, uh, it's minimal in most children, but you may want to perf uh, perform like drug-free trials yearly. So usually this is around the summertime when they don't have uh, class. You know, some parents are just like, they need to be on all the time. Um, but for some kids, they can probably go off of it over the summer period. So that could be good for them to kind of get back to a baseline. Uh, we also have some non-stimulant drugs that are available as well. Uh, this first one being adamoxetine or Stratera. This one is uh, a, a selective norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It's not used for depression, um, but has uh, been approved for use in adults. And so this one has slower onset of action. You know, uh, an amphetamine product works immediately, basically, whereas this one takes a few weeks to really start to kick in. Um, the nice thing here is there's no abuse potential, so it's not a controlled substance. Okay, so that's kind of one of the, uh, the pros there. Um, you will certainly uh, see some of uh, the norepinephrine effects. So you can see hypertension, tachycardia, um, but there's a black box warning for suicidal ideation, just like you saw with the, the antidepressants. So just be aware of that. 
And then we also have some alpha-2 agonists. So uh, these are the kind of the, the downers that I mentioned that sometimes patients will be kind of co-prescribed along with their stimulants, especially at nighttime. Um, so they can either be used by themselves or sometimes in conjunction with the amphetamines. But this is guanfacine and clonidine. Um, guanfacine, I didn't put the brand name on here, but if you ever see Intuniv, that is the extended release preparation of, of guanfacine uh, that you can see used, uh, I-N-T-U-N-I-V. Um, that is a, a common one that patients will be on. Um, the mechanism here is that instead of causing increased catecholamine release, they're going to activate those alpha-2 receptors and decrease the amount of catecholamines coming out from the CNS. Um, so they're going to help to lower blood pressure, lower the heart rate, kind of just decrease sympathetic nervous system uh, throughout the body. Um, some people think it might help to improve memory and cognition by increasing blood flow to the prefrontal cortex, but I'm not sure if that's really been uh, taken as, as gospel yet. Um, you will see that these are not as effective as the stimulants, but they can be sometimes useful in conjunction. Um, adverse effects include sedation, as you might imagine, uh, hypotension, and then possibly constipation. Okay, so therapy obviously needs to be personalized for your individual patients. Um, the dosage form is going to be dependent on a lot of factors. So looking at the schedule for the patient, you know, obviously a college student versus an adult in the working world versus a child in, in kindergarten is going to be very different. So it may require different dosage forms or different kind of dosing strategies there. Um, look at their comorbid states. Obviously, if you have a patient who, say, has really uncontrolled hypertension, you may not want to give them uh, an amphetamine. Maybe you want to try something like a guanfacine or a clonidine that can be helpful for controlling their blood pressure. Um, but in general, the approach is going to be to use stimulants, uh, unless contraindicated, then you can use your non-stimulant agents. Uh, and then also potentially consider antidepressant therapy. Maybe that, it could be useful for some patients, especially if that's kind of a, uh, a comorbid um, issue going on at the same time. Okay, so any questions on ADHD meds? Yes? Um, for the alpha-2 agonist, you said it decreases synthetic activity. Mm -hmm. what if, why is it not increasing it? Isn't um, alpha-2 so remember the alpha-2 receptor is that autoreceptor. So if you think of the synapse, you have the the, um, the adrenergic neuron releasing onto to this neuron here. Um, the alpha-2 receptor sits on the on the kind of the back end of that initial initiating neuron. And so when you have enough catecholamines floating out in there in the synapse, it's going to feed back and tell that receptor, the alpha-2 receptor, hey, we have enough catecholamines here, just stop sending more out, right? So by activating that receptor specifically, you can decrease the amount of catecholamine outflow that you have. It's the same process we saw for hypertension with clonidine. You can do the same thing here. All right, so any other questions on that section at all? I think that's all the behavioral stuff.